Millions of people dream of coming to America. They come for various reasons, such as to live in freedom, to practice their religion freely, to escape poverty or oppression, and to make better lives for themselves and their children. But the real reason for coming is prosperity and the freedom to be successful. For decades, economic growth has easily surpassed population growth, giving the United States and much of the rest of the world both more people and more prosperity. Simply put, the desire for a better life somewhere other than their current country is the biggest motivator and this is what America offers that better life they wish for and dream of. And one of those dreamers that wanted a better life in America was Norin Bunn. Norin had escaped from one of the worst genocides in world history, perpetrated by the Cambodian Khmer Rouge during the Pol Pot regime. On April 17, 1975, the Khmer Rouge, a communist guerrilla group led by Pol Pot, took power in Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia. They forced all city dwellers into the countryside and to labor camps to work in the fields as slaves. During their rule, it is estimated that two million Cambodians, roughly 30% of the Cambodian population, died of starvation, torture, and execution. Every single Cambodian citizen lost family members or was injured in some way by the Khmer Rouge's influence in the country. The people were worked until they collapsed and died of exhaustion, disease, or starvation. And from this horrible world, Norin Bun escaped to come to America. Norin's American dream started to come true for a while. She obtained an accounting degree, she got married to Sifo Bun, and they had three beautiful daughters. Then on May 12, 2002, Norin suddenly began feeling ill and was admitted to Provena St. Joseph Hospital in Elgin, Illinois, a suburb outside of Chicago. She was diagnosed with a form of toxic shock syndrome and a central venous catheter was placed to deliver intravenous antibiotics. After a stormy course, Norin was recovering such that her doctor ordered her antibiotics discontinued and the central line removed. While preparing to properly remove the catheter, a nurse, Latoya Diltz, negligently and inadvertently dislodged the catheter such that air was allowed to enter the vein, resulting in an air embolism that caused a cardiorespiratory arrest. By the time the code blue responders were able to restore oxygenation, Norin had suffered irreversible brain damage. In this insider exclusive special, Medical Malpractice, The Norin Bun Story, we bring you the inside story direct from the courtroom on how Norin's family lawyer, Don Shapiro, founder and partner at the law firm of Don Shapiro Limited, got justice for Norin's family with a record-breaking verdict in excess of $24.7 million. Every day, somewhere in America, more than 300 innocent men, women, and children become victims of medical malpractice at the hands of incompetent and negligent doctors. Last year, over 98,000 victims were killed by doctors. More than 4 million victims are permanently injured each year. Don Shapiro has earned the highest respect from citizens and lawyers alike as one of the best people's trial lawyers in Illinois and in the nation. He has seen many innocent and hardworking people taken injured and killed by negligent and incompetent doctors, hospitals, and nurses. And because of that, he is driven to fight for people who have been harmed by the willful or negligent actions of others. He learned a long time ago that if a man hasn't discovered something that he will die for, he isn't fit to live. 
His goals, not only to get justice for his clients, but to make sure health care is safer by holding hospitals and negligent doctors and nurses much more accountable. Because injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And justice and power must be brought together so that whatever is just may be powerful and whatever is powerful may be just. Hi, I'm Steve Murphy and this is the Insider Exclusive, live from Chicago, Illinois at the law firm of Donald Shapiro Limited. It is my great privilege and pleasure to introduce Don Shapiro to the show. Welcome to the show, Don. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Tell us, a little, our audience, a little bit about what type of law you practice. What kind of lawyer are you? I represent victims of injury. People have been victims of medical malpractice who have gone to the doctor or the hospital and wound up injured worse than when they came in. Mm -hmm. People have been involved in catastrophic motor vehicle collisions. People have been murdered by the police. Yeah. I want to point out to our audience that um, many of these people don't have any money when they come to you. And, and as a trial lawyer, you analyze their case, you evaluate it, and you make a great investment of your time and your own financial resources in pursuing and prosecuting a case on their behalf, don't you? Oh, absolutely. And you've got to regard every case very carefully before you plunge in. So, you know, the concept that uh, lawyers represent patients and bring frivolous lawsuits, yeah. Uh, not true. Yeah. You've got to be certain it's a good case before you proceed. This particular case we're going to talk about today is about a Cambodian immigrant who came to the United States. Her name was Narin Bun. Tell a little, our audience a little bit about who she was. Narin was a lovely lady who came to this country uh, basically fleeing the Khmer Rouge as a young child with her parents, uh, established a new life in America, she became an accountant. She became an accountant. Uh, ironically, she wound up working for the same nursing home that she later became a patient at. Mm -hmm. uh, she met another young Cambodian immigrant, Sipo Bun. They got married. They had three beautiful young daughters. And then this tragedy happened. And that's what this case revolves all about. So tell our audience what happened. Sure. Uh, Narin had been hospitalized because she had a very bad infection uh, called toxic shock syndrome. And the doctors had placed a central catheter, which is a tube, into her central venous artery okay, in order to deliver antibiotics. And they did a great job. They took wonderful care of Narin and had basically nursed her back to health. The doctor said, you know what? She doesn't need the antibiotics, gave an order to the nursing staff to remove the intravenous catheter. That's where the problem happened. And what was that problem? Okay. The problem is that when you take the catheter out, you've got to do it carefully. You've got to do it appropriately. And what you have to do is you have to cover the hole, essentially, where the catheter has gone into the vein. And you have to slowly remove it and keep it covered. How do you cover it? With your hand or with the, the gauze? The nurse ta takes, takes gauze, yeah. she applies pressure, pulls it out, then she takes a bandage and bandages it to keep that seal. And it doesn't take long for it to seal. And the reason that you don't, what you're doing that is you don't want air to get in the vein, right? Exactly. Air is supposed to be on the outside and you can breathe it in and it goes in that way, but it's not supposed to go into your veins. And the air pressure is such that it can go into your vein and then it can cause what's called an air embolism or a clot. Mm -hmm formed by air, and that's exactly what happened. This nurse wasn't paying attention to what she was doing. Somehow, she knocked the catheter out while she was looking around, came back, oh my God. It was completely open, nobody had applied pressure. Right. Air got in, caused an air embolism. Narin went into cardiorespiratory arrest, and they tried to resuscitate her, and they did successfully resuscitate her, but in the meantime, she had suffered catastrophic brain damage. Right. 
Now, when this case was brought to you, how did you analyze to take the case? What made you decide to take this case? Okay, well, the first thing we did in this case, as we do in many of our cases, I look for the best experts in the field that I can find. And I ask them to take a look at the facts and give me their opinion. Was this done right? What happened to this lady? And is this a question of just one of those things that happened in the ordinary course, or is it because a health care provider failed to do his or her job? Right. In this case, we ran it by a top qualified nurse. We took it to a critical care physician. We took it to a neurologist, and we asked all of them, what happened here? And they told us this nurse did not do her job. She right. failed to do her job. And that's why the patient suffered this horrible outcome. Now, you depose Nurse Diltz, and we have her deposition. We're going to go to that right now. With respect to this specific procedure, do you recall exactly what you did? Do I recall exactly what I did right. with the procedure? Do you want me to tell you how I took out the central line? Is that yes. what you're asking me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Do you recall how you did it? Um, with this specific patient? Right. Um, no. As we can see, she clearly doesn't want to admit responsibility and clearly doesn't say that uh, she did it or didn't do it. It's very vague and ambiguous. Right. You know, this is probably the worst thing that ever happened in her career and she had absolutely no memory of what happened. Yeah. You know, it sounded pretty far-fetched, but we have the burden of proof in these cases. Yes. So the question is, how are we going to prove it? The nurse says, well, you know, I don't really remember what happened, but when I do this, I do it right by the book. Yeah. And then she gave the textbook description as to how you're supposed to remove the catheter. Yeah. Now, you had a surprise witness, didn't you, from the hospital? Tell our audience a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, th this was amazing. We found, found one of the doctors who we, we take depositions of all the doctors before trial to find out what they're going to say. Mm -hmm. And this was a doctor who wasn't even present at the time of this event. Mm -hmm. uh, but I asked him for the sake of completeness, did you happen to talk to Nurse Diltz by any chance after this happened? He goes, as a matter of fact, I ran into her that morning. I said, really? Well, tell us what happened. Well, Nurse Diltz told me that she had turned away for a minute uh, in order to grab something off a tray, which we later found out should have been right there, so she wouldn't have had to turn. And when she turned back, the catheter was out of the patient. So she admitted it to her she own staff. She admitted it to somebody on the medical staff. Yeah. Now, when your witness was on the stand, were there objections on the other side? What were they saying? Well, they couldn't really object to a question <laughs> as to what did the nurse tell yeah. you, but I think they, did they were did they, sitting there hoping that the doctor would recant his testimony. And this doctor was a well-respected, is a well-respected oh, doctor sure. at the Oh, sure. He was a, a board-certified infectious disease specialist yeah. on the staff of the hospital. Yeah. So getting a doctor to testify as to the truth about what happened yeah. is not always easy, but this was a stand-up guy. <clears throat> yeah. Now, in determining, you know, it's the hospital's fault. We're, getting in that, we're going in that direction. But in determining the cash value of future medical expenses, lost wages, and economic value, how is that done? Well, we had... A lifetime care plan for Naren. We had a rehabilitative medicine specialist who was in charge of our care. I asked him, yeah. doctor, who was a doctor, Robert Eilers, how much money will it take to take care of Naren on an annual basis? Yes. And he went through, I mean, he calculated how much it would take for all the medical supplies, right. health care. She needed 24 hour care. And this is based on cost increases of care too over the years. Well, he gives us the figures in today's dollars. Then we hired a professor from the University of Illinois, Dr. Charles Linke, to project those costs into the future yeah. and then reduce them to their present cash value. Mm -hmm. Kind of a complicated process, but you have to go through all this. 
Now, a critical issue at trial was the defendant's position that Norin was in a vegetative state. Yes. And therefore would require less money to take care of her, wasn't it? Right. Yeah, that was their, they had twofold approach. Number one, if she was in a permanent vegetative state, mm -hmm. uh, her life expectancy would be markedly reduced, and therefore they should have to pay less money. Didn't need as much money. Right. right. And second of all, they said, well, you know, she's in a permanent vegetative state, so not much pain and suffering. Yeah. Okay. The only problem with that is that Nurin was not in a permanent vegetative state. You provided us some videotape, which we're going to go to right now, showing Nurin with her family, responding to her family, and responding to the defense's expert witness that shows clearly that she is not in a vegetative state. So we'll go to that right now. All right, Naren, over here. Can you look at me over here? Naren? Naren? No, I'm over here. Can you see me over here? I'm going to move your head a little bit. There we go. Come on, look at me. Look at my big nose. See if you can see my big nose. That's very good. Can you see my nose? You're smiling. Okay. All right. And your comments on that? We had two remarkable incidents. First of all, we had a situation. Narin was in the, in the nursing home where she was being cared for. Mm -hmm. And Narin's parents drove in from Minnesota. Mm -hmm. There was also, fortuitously, a Cambodian minister, friend of the family, who happened to be there that day. And he was chanting prayers in Cambodian, and you could just see Narin's reaction right. to it. Crying and... And then her parents spoke to her, and when the parents spoke, she was smiling. And Dad started talking, and she turned her head and smiled yes. at Dad. And then Mom started talking, and she turned and smiled at Mom. Clearly How not, you, yeah. Clearly not in a vegetative state. Right. Tell us about the verdict. Big record-breaking verdict, was yeah. it? Yeah especially in the jurisdiction. This is a uh, outlying suburban county in, uh, outside of Chicago. It's a Kane County. And they had never had a malpractice verdict in excess of $6 million. Mm -hmm. This was $24.7 million. So it shattered the previous records. And that was really one reason we couldn't get the case settled because they kept saying, hey, Shapiro, you're out here in Kane County. Yeah. This is a little bit of a semi-rural, semi-suburban area. No big verdicts out here. Unfortunately, six months after the verdict came in, she passed away. So. Yes. Let's talk about medical malpractice. You know, for our audience, what is medical malpractice? Well, medical malpractice means that the doctor or the nurse, as the case may be, uh, fail to follow the usual standard of care in the profession and as a result caused injury to a patient. Mm -hmm. And the usual standard of care is what a reasonably well-qualified doctor would do under the same or similar circumstances. There are many people watching this show today and they would probably ask this question, what do you do when you suspect medical malpractice? What's the first thing you should do? Call Don Shapiro. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, you want to get all the records together. Let's say one of your loved ones. The hospital will injured. fight you tooth and nail about oh, getting absolutely. records, right? Even though they're required to oh, give them. Oh, they'll them. give you the records eventually. Sometimes it takes, you know, half a dozen phone calls, yeah. letters, threats, even lawsuit just yeah. to get the records. And sometimes the records are changed. Well, that happens from time to time. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you want to get all those records together, bring them to the lawyer, yeah. or go to the lawyer, have the lawyer get the records. Now, when you talk about um, call Don Shapiro, how does Don Shapiro evaluate medical malpractice claims and cases? Well, I read the records, I talk to the patient or the patient's family, mm -hmm. And then I bring in a medical consultant. I try to find the best doctor I can in that particular field to look at it, to advise me. Um, you read the relevant medical literature. You have to become an expert in that field. I can tell you anything you want about removing an intravenous catheter. Right. I know my case. Mm -hmm. And you know what goes wrong and what shouldn't, right? right? Um, you hear a lot about medical malpractice caps. 
you hear the U.S. Chamber of Commerce saying, oh, you know, these frivolous trial lawyers, file, excuse me, these trial lawyers filing frivolous lawsuits are driving doctors out of business, driving up health care premiums. Is that true? It's not true at all. Uh, first of all, we don't bring frivolous claims. Every claim has to be certified by another physician that it's meritorious before you can even file this. Really? Yes. A lot of people don't know that. No, they don't Is know that. Is it hard to find another physician who will certify that claim? It, it is hard to find a physician. And you want to also use a well-qualified physician right. because you want somebody who's going to stand behind it. You don't yeah. want to just follow your suit and not have it yeah. go forward. So the idea that frivolous lawsuits wind up getting big verdicts yeah. is nonsense. If they're frivolous, they get thrown they never out get to or court. they never even get yeah. to the courtroom door. So have medical malpractice caps, and you have them in some states, have they lowered doctors' health care premiums? No, that's, that's the startling fact that caps really don't work yeah. except to further line the pockets of the insurance companies yeah. who don't have to pay the big verdicts. I want to thank you very much for being on the program. You are a godsend to people who don't have money but have a great case and keep up the good work. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com. 